that the stereotyping was incredible even at that period. Fear is on both sides with migration. They feared us and we feared them. Australia, from thinking monoculturally, moves to multiculturalism. What we do here is not good enough to be considered Greek Australian culture and it doesn't stand on its own. When working class women write memoir, it's deemed a bit trivial. The losers of the civil war and that were the communists, those were the communists. Welcome to Think Greek, I'm Kyriakos Gold and we are at the Commons QV here at Melbourne's Greek Quarter. We're going to talk about Greek Australian migration and we will focus on the period between 1945 and 1967, the big migration wave. George, what were the newspapers of the time? Of course, newspapers started appearing in Australia in the 1910s. Okay? And in the 1950s, we still have um, great newspapers, very conservative newspapers, but great newspapers. Panellinius Kyrikas, Ethnico Vima. Uh, we have the publication of Foss and Pirsos in the 1940s. In 1950s, okay? Pirsos, that's right, that's right, yes, exactly. But if you look, if you read carefully, for example, very recently I read Ethnikov Vima from the 1930 to the 1950s, okay? Because I'm, I'm involved in writing a, a, hist a history project. So if you read the newspapers, they were creating the Greek Australian identity, basically. They were tremendous power, okay? They were very conservative. They accepted, as a matter of fact, that we are foreigners. We have to be grateful. The, 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 the British are superior. Uh, before the British came in Australia, you had dingoes, kangaroo, and uh, indigenous Australians. They were all on the same level, this kind of thing. They were pro-metaxas. They were uh, strongly anti-communists. Okay? When we move to the 1950s and the communities change, there is a very strong left element, and we have the publication at the beginning of the 1950s of Australiani uh, Epitheodicy. It was a journal that was closed by the government for political reasons. And in this particular journal, Greeks directly address the question of Greek Australian identity. And they try to mix the Greek and the Australian. They find common elements in the struggle of Australian people for better conditions. And they also translate Australian literature. For example, Dimitris Kogos Diana of Rios Cosmos, before he became Diana of Cosmos, translates. Uh, Australian literature into Greek. In 1957, we have something different, a different entity, Neos Cosmos, which becomes the voice of the Greek who thinks of themselves as citizens. And they challenge, if you like, injustices, or they talk about migrant rights and multiculturalism. And who better to talk to us about Neos Cosmos than Sotiris Hadzmanolis? Emena Ignosi Mustiris de Saosa Echo Diavasi, Gati. Είμαι σχετικά νέος. Ήρθα στα μέσα της δεκαετίας του 70 εδώ. Λοιπόν, οι παλιοί μετανάστες, ε, άξιοι, προκομμένοι, ε, είχαν δημιουργήσει σημαντικές επιχειρήσεις, σημαντικές υποδομές της ελληνικής παροικίας, αλλά ήταν και πολύ νομοταγής εντός εισαγωγικών. Αυτοί που ήρθαν κατά τη δεκαετία του 50, στα τέλη της δεκαετίας του 50 και αρχές του 60, από συντηρητικές ελληνικές κοινωνίες και θύματα ίσως και της σκληρής πολιτικής αντιπαράθεσης που υπήρχε τότε στην Ελλάδα, ήταν λίγο πιο ανήσυχοι. Όταν ερχόταν εδώ πέρα, οι παλιοί τους συμβούλευαν να είναι φρόνιμοι, νομοταγείς και ευγνώμονες στην Αυστραλία που τους δέχτηκε. Υπήρχαν όμως και κάποιες ανήσυχες φωνές, Ανάμεσά του ήταν και η εφημερίδα στην οποία έχω την τιμή να εργάζομαι τώρα ο νέο κόσμο που ξεκίνησε στα τέλη τη δεκαετία του 50, αριστερή εφημερίδα από αριστερού, και άρχισε να μιλάει για τα δικαιώματα των εργαζομένων, για πολυπολιτισμό, για ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα κτλ. Οι άνθρωποι αυτοί από τη συντηρητική κοινωνία την αγκάλιασαν την εφημερίδα, εκείνη υιοθέτησε τι ανάγκε του και έγινε ένα όχημα διεκδικήσεων. Οπότε σιγά σιγά άλλαζε πλέον ε, και η παρικία, θα έλεγα και η Αυστραλία, γιατί αυτό που γινόταν μέσα στις τάξεις της ομογένειας γινόταν και στις τάξεις των άλλων παρικιών εκείς εποχής της Ιταλικής και άλλων που ήταν από την Ευρώπη ε, κυρίως. Ε, έτσι λοιπόν είδαμε στη δεκαετία του 60 
να γίνονται σημαντικά συλλαλητήρια από Έλληνε μετανάστε, εργάτε και να διεκδικούν δικαιώματα. Και βεβαίω στη δεκαετία του 70 να δικαιώνονται, γιατί όταν ήρθε στην εξουσία το Εργατικό Κόμμα το 1972, υιοθέτησε πολλέ από αυτέ τι θέσει και λίγο αργότερα τι υιοθέτησε και ο Συνασπισμό Φιλελευθέρων Εθνικών, που έκανε επίσημη πολιτική τη χώρα τον πολυπολιτισμό. Οπότε είχαμε τεράστιες αλλαγές στο πολιτικό κοινωνικό επίπεδο. Οι αλλαγές αυτές βέβαια δεν περιορίστηκαν μόνο εκεί, ήταν και μέσα στην παρικία μας. Παλιά υπήρχε μια ελληνική εκκλησία, ελάχιστες οργανώσεις, η κοινότητα και ελάχιστες οργανώσεις από τους παλιούς μετανάστες, των Ιθακησίων, από το Καστελόριζο, από τα Κύθερα. Μετά γέμισε η Αυστραλία με εθνικοτοπικές οργανώσεις. Όπως είπαμε, ξεκίνησε από την αριστερά, από ορισμένους προοδευτικούς ανθρώπους. Ήταν δύσκολα τα πρώτα χρόνια και επειδή μιλούσε τη γλώσσα της ανάγκης των ομογενών εκείνης της εποχής, την αγκάλιασαν και την έπαιρναν, ας πούμε, οι ίδιοι την προωθούσαν στα εργοστάσια, την πουλούσαν, οργάνωναν εκδηλώσεις για να συγκεντρώσουν χρήματα σε όλη την Αυστραλία ε, για να καλύψουν ε, τα έξοδα. Κατά τη διάρκεια της δικτατορία στην Ελλάδα θα πρέπει να σημειώσουμε ε, ο νέος κόμμας πήρε έτσι δυναμικά στάση εναντίον και συνέβαλε στο να οργανωθούν πάρα πολλές εκδηλώσεις. Να έρθει εδώ τότε ο Ανδρέας Παπανδρέου, ο αργότερα ο Μίκης Σοδωράκης, ε, να δένουν τα πλοία των Ελλήνων εφαπλιστών οι ναυτεργάτες. Μεγάλος αγώνας. Και υπέστη βέβαια και ένα σημαντικό κόστος, γιατί τότε τα προξενία έδιναν εντολές στις ελληνικές επιχειρήσεις, τις μικρές τότε ελληνικές επιχειρήσεις, να μην διαφημίζουν στην εφημερίδα, γιατί αν διαφημίζαν στον νέο κόσμο, ε, θα είχαν ε, κάποιο κόστος σε ό,τι σημαίνει αυτό, να μην μπορούν να πάνε στην Ελλάδα ή οι δικοί τους πίσω στην Ελλάδα. Το κόστος ήταν τεράστιο, το οποίο η εφημερίδα, θα πρέπει να πούμε βέβαια, το εξαργύρωσε εντός εισαγωγικών, το 1974 όταν κατέρευσε η Χούντα. Τότε, ας πούμε, μεγάλωσε πιο πολύ, έγινε αποδεκτή πλέον από όλου και από το 1974 και μετά. Ε, Άρχισαν και αυτοί που εργάζονται στην εφημερίδα να νιώθουν λίγο σαν σούπερ σαν προσωπικότητα, γιατί πληρονόρια κιόλα. We've heard what people were writing and reading, and you're the best person to talk to us about uh, literature and how identity traveled through art and literature. I'll tell you how my interest in literature started, Kiriako. I started to want to learn about the history of our community. So I resorted to history books that were written by various well-known personages, you know, within our community. And reading those books, you would be forgiven for thinking that post-1945, no women came mm. to this country. Every single thing I read, even, I have to be honest, however well-intentioned they were, even newspapers, even periodicals, <laughs> you would think that the citizens of post-war migration were men. Um, I gave one of the history books to my daughter just to verify that in case I was being biased. And she said, no, mum, really, it, it's, a, it's a history of male discourse. So I thought, where do I find about the history? Where do I find the face of Greek Australian post-war women? and I found it in their literature. Not only did I find aspects of their lives in their literature, but I also found really beautiful details of, you know, this mass of working class people that came in the, you know, post 1945, 1950s, but also found things about the working classes in this literature. Uh, women wrote about different things. For example, women used male pseudonyms because their works wouldn't be accepted in literary competitions. Uh, women wrote about things that pertain to them. So they wrote about cooking and about motherhood and about their experiences. Um, one of the things that really, really concerns me very much is that when we talk about histories, it tends to be either a history of the winners or and particularly the history of male winners um, and so that's where my fascination with the literature emanating from women the other thing of course was uh, they're very honest in their literature 
in the 50s and 60s, no one read. They thought they were just writing for their own pleasure. And it's only subsequently. Um, one of the things that's very interesting is the aspect of class in relation to memoir. When we have someone like Anna Komnini writing a memoir, it is deemed history. When working class women write memoir, it's deemed a bit trivial, not to be taken seriously, and that would affront me. Um, one of the very interesting things now that I've seen with works that I've translated is that I'm approached by historians in the wider community for these works because they are a documentation that actually records the lives of women, of our mothers, you know, our mother's gardens and our mother's kitchens. Some very well-known pieces of work were written here. We were talking early on today about the Trito Stefani. Yes, Tarcis. Well, Tarcis is an actually interesting case because he transcends gender. He was a cross-dresser. He was a gay man uh, in the 1950s in Sydney, writing amazing work estranged from the mainstream Greek community as it existed at the time and supported by his Australian friends. And we have his correspondence, which has recently been published here in Australia by the family that uh, looked after him, hosted him, befriended him, uh, Anglo-Australians. And in there you can track the creative process. You can see how uh, Dachtsis manifested his sexuality outside the Greek community because there was no outlet that he could find within the Greek community for his particular sexuality, uh, often putting himself at risk, placing himself on the margin of the mainstream community because those acts were illegal at the time, and uh, using elements of that to write his work. So he's living his sexuality and his corporeal life in Australia, but at the same time he's writing what are considered modern day masterpieces directed towards Greece. So he's transcending and living in two parallel worlds at the same time. It's and he's someone, understand. absolutely it does. Um, but the, the issue is that Tachtsis, as far as Greek Australians largely are concerned, is considered a foreign element in, insofar as he's considered a Greek writer, not a Greek Australian writer, in, in the mainstream Greek Australian consciousness. And there's a funny thing about the Greek Australian consciousness, there is, what I call historical amnesia about our historical trajectory. And that basically means that our migration story begins up upon the arrival of our family on these shores or the people that come from our village tying into that lo local uh, bias. And there is almost complete ignorance of all of the things that happened before. So the bombing of, it's now Karas Music in Lonsdale Street the problems with the trade union movement, uh, the Kalgoorlie riots, uh, the fight between newspapers in the 50s and the ideological things, these have been forgotten. They are not taught to Greek Australian children. They don't form part of our popular consciousness. It's almost as if, as a Greek Australian community, our anthropology is about straddling mainstream Australia and mainstream Greece and considering that we're living under a cultural cringe whereby what we do here is not good enough to be considered Greek Australian culture and it doesn't stand on its own. So there is this problem and this fault line running through the discourse, whether it's our engagement within the Australian community or our understanding of who we are negotiating our Greek identity. And I think uh, referring to Tarxias is, is a great uh, segue for that kind of discussion. I sense, Dean, that it's too late, potentially, to try and address that issue of the Greek-Australian history. And I sense that what we're doing now um, is the next generation, which are my children's generation, have taken up the mantle of writing about not their parents, but their grandparents. It's interesting to see how many are writing now prolifically around their grandparents' story which is, uh, I'm sure you've come across it as well. And, it's, and I think that's where the future of trying to tie in some of these loose threads or bring it together perhaps in a more concise I, I way that might the be because- grandparents are more exotic. Yes, they are. That's, they, well, for whatever reason, important. that's what they're doing. So again, it's that search for authenticity. What's yeah. happened here isn't yeah. good enough. Yeah. We've got to go back there.
but it's also a recognition of their own roots. They understand their sense of inheritance well, possibly, through the grandparents possibly. and the struggle, yes. And they're coming from a more empowered position. This generation is more empowered because it's been born here. It hasn't had to endure the conflicts associated with becoming an Australian. In their heads, they are. They're now indulging in understanding their inheritance. So is the question, does migration mythology become attractive if it is a mythology of victimhood and sacrifice? I think it's an interesting question. I don't know whether I agree or disagree. I think the human condition tends to respond more to adversity and create creative people in particular will focus on adversity. So your writers, your filmmakers, uh, your artists are more involved in, 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 in their creativity is expressed through that adversity and often, and in, as is obvious, the adversity is the struggles of their grandparents which form the basis of their sense of who they are and what their place is. They were the first generation who came and it, I, I've noticed it as well in my, amongst my students, for example, at Monash. It's this respect that these people were the pioneers Pioneers, they came and faced all manner of adversity for a better life. There's so many points. I was going to ask whether the Greek community has been kind to women and then whether we've been kind to the queer community, but you've just hammered everything at once. I just wanted to say that potentially creatives focus on adversity because of their lived experience as well. You know, as a queer man myself, like you're always a foreign object in the Greek Australian community. It's not an easy task. No, and most artists, their greatest works, whatever they are, literary, whatever, are inspired by adversity. That's my experience. Uh, I'm not going to be generalistic yeah, and say, if you're a happy person, you're not creative. But the truth is most creative people, and some of the great creative minds, have endured and have been inspired and, and enabled largely by a lot of adversity and introspective soul searching. Did you want to share your story that we started with? I mean, we are in this era. What we've missed is a substrata of the Greek migration. And the substrata, which I think is quite peculiar to Greece, is this, let's call it the losers of the civil war, the communists. It usually goes the other way around. Like we, we get the, the ones that lost out to the communists coming here in the Eastern Bloc. Whereas I know from my father, there was a significant proportion of Greeks in Australia who escaped the Civil War. And there was a large section of our Greek community post-war that was communist. And I know from my father also that it, was actually, it, it actually became quite, quite popular in the Greek community to be an ex-communist. That if you were a known communist and you lost your job for whatever reason, you could never get another job. You're unemployable. So, um, my father entered into a dispute between three Australians and a Greek, without picking on a Greek. Um, he got hauled in with the Greek, the three Australians weren't hauled in, and they both got sacked on the spot. So my father, by the time my mother and my three siblings arrived in this country, had been unemployed for 18 months, had lost all his money, was penniless, and couldn't get another job. My father's entrance papers into Australia was stamped communist. That's what it said in his entrance papers. So that's why when he got the sack, he could never get another job. So we, we got forced to, to get a fish shop. My father became fearful of politics in this country, discouraged us from being involved in politics. He was so fearful. There is another element within the Greek community that was, no, that was discriminated against even more than the overall Greek community. And that were the communists. Those were the communists. The journey never ends. Stay with us for more Think Greek next week. The Greek communities in Australia were divided along the lines of the Civil War. And as a Greek girl, I thought, why is a non-Greek writing about such an intimate topic? And even elderly Greek women are starting to become empowered.